Okay. Um, so it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our next uh, ISR distinguished speaker in our uh, speaker series, um, Professor Myra Cohen. Uh, she's a professor in software engineering at the Department of Computer Science at Iowa State University. And prior to that, she was uh, a professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, Lincoln um, for a number of years in the E squared group when, um, you know, kind of a big kind of a team of uh, software engineering professors. Um, she's won many awards. She's, uh, she received the uh, NSF Career Award. Um, she was an Air Force Young Investigator Award recipient. Um, she was a member of the DARPA Computer Science Study Group. Um, she was the general chair of ASC, um, the International Conference on uh, software, automated software engineering. And um, rec well, recently she was a program chair of ICST, um, International Software Testing. And very, very recently, she's just kind of recovering from the stress of being the program chair for ESEC FSC um, 2020, which just completed this, this week. Um, and, um, and so she's, she's just gotten the chance to breathe and now she's got a She's got to come here and, um, and deliver this talk. Oh, she's also an ACM Distinguished Scientist. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, so uh, can everybody unmute their mics just for a second and introduce uh, Myra Cohen. Thank you, thank you Jim. And thank you everybody for inviting me um, to um, to UC Irvine. I hope to come in the future in person and meet everybody, um, but I'm happy to speak today. I've got the chat open. I'll try to watch it. If any um, really important things come through, I'll try to answer them. But if not, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So today I want to talk about what I call assuring um, organic programs or what we're calling software engineering in the future. Um, and so I work in my laboratory. I call on the laboratory for variability aware assurance and testing of organic programs. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand what I mean about that. So software engineering is all really about context. So I'm gonna take a step back and try to put this talk into context and perspective how I ended up here. So I'm gonna go way back to 1969. This is before I was doing software engineering or um, any computer science. And at the time we were trying to send um, men to the moon. This was in the US at the time. And one of our first software engineers was Margaret Hamilton, who was working at MIT um, as um, running a software engineering lab. And she was writing code for the Apollo 11. Um, just before it was about to land, there was a, a warning message started, um, uh, started alarming and they had to make a go no go decision about for whether they were gonna actually land on the moon. And her team, um, trusted her and at that point she said go ahead because she understood she had actually put into her software she had put a lot of um, error correction code and she was detecting these potential problems with hardware and so it was going the software was going to protect that and they went ahead and had a successful landing so it's kind of a really nice early software engineering success um, around the same time there were two NATO conferences that were occurring and what was happening then around um, 1969 and 70 is people were starting to worry about um, the complexity of software and the fact that our systems weren't working as well as they could and that we had these really large systems we needed to have um, better software engineering and they termed something called the software engineering crisis. So this is kind of puts us in context of way back before I started in this area, um, but we already talking about the need for really good software engineering practices. Uh, now, if we move ahead about 30 years to 1999, and this is just around when I was starting to do software engineering, so that's when I taught my first software engineering class, and I was thinking about um, just about to go back to grad school to work on my PhD. Um, and around that time, we gave a Turing Award to Fred Brooks, who many of you have known from his books because part of his um, the acknowledgement was in the area of software engineering, and he wrote two books, um, Mythical Man Month, two of them 20 years apart, so the second was a follow-up. I still use these in my software engineering classes. And so Fred Brooks was talking about, uh, he's very well known for talking about the fact that adding manpower to a late software project makes it later, and I think we all still agree that this is wisdom 
Um, so he had a lot to say about software projects. And one thing he talked a lot about was he talked about this idea of complexity. And he talked about the fact that there wasn't any silver bullet. This was in his 20 year edition. It was an essay he had written a few um, years earlier. And he talked about the fact that there were two parts to software. There was this accidental and essential complexity. And the accidental complexity comes from our tools and the systems or environments we're working in. But the essential complexity is the difficulty of the software and the logic and being able to work with these systems. And so he was arguing at the time that we really um, weren't going to find any magic ways to suddenly do better in software. Well, if we now move ahead another, at this point, another 20 years, and we're now in 2020, um, I think I can argue that we've done a lot with software engineering. Um, so I've been doing software engineering um, at a university for almost uh, for probably 16, 17 years now. And I would say we've gotten really good at automation. We've improved our software processes. We have test-driven development. We have high-level languages, tools and programming environments. So we've removed a lot of that accidental complexity. And we also have very good modeling techniques. And so we actually have also reduced some of the essential complexity. So software engineering has taken huge leaps and bounds in the 50 years since that first slide. Um, and so today I want to talk a little bit about where it's going and what the future is. So one of the problems is, because we've been doing so well, we're able to big, build bigger systems. And so they're getting more complex. They're connected. They're cyber physical. They're nanoscale. And I'm going to talk a little bit about nanoscale today. And they're self-modifying. And so all of these things add additional complexity that we weren't even dreaming about 50 years ago when we started this. Um, so what is the, so the, so the future of software engineering? Um, so this is a real sign from one of the last times I was traveling. And it's warning me that it's a self-driving bus. And so I should be aware of the fact that this vehicle coming down the street is not going to um, have a human there. They're not potentially going to react in the way that I would expect them to react. And so you're probably all thinking, well, I'm going to give a talk about the future of software engineering is about AI and self-driving systems. Not quite. Um, so AI and software engineering clearly is um, a foundation. It's something that everybody is talking about today as being the future. So here's a paper on artificial intelligence and software engineering. This was written by David Barstow, and this was written in 1987. So going back in context again, this is still before I was doing software engineering. Um, this was a paper that um, was arguing for the fact that we needed to use techniques from artificial intelligence like heuristic search and formal inference systems and knowledge representation. Um, and in fact, one of our large software engineering conferences, Automated Software Engineering, 35 years ago when they were starting, um, they were all about AI and software engineering. But we didn't really have some of the tools then to make this as, um, as scalable as we, we are today. And so today we're really moving more in this direction. Um, but AI has a large range of topics. And so I'm not going to talk about some of the things you're thinking about, such as driving those self-driving cars. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about something we call um, search. So there's this idea called search-based software engineering. And um, around 2003, this um, seminal paper came out from a group of uh, researchers. Um, Mark Herman's probably the most well-known in this group for this field. He's one, been one of the leaders for the last um, you know, 30, 20 years on this topic. And the idea is that we could take software engineering problems, which are hard optimization problems, and we could reformulate them as a search. And then we could use some of these algorithms that Barstow was talking about which are AI algorithms in order to solve these problems. And so around this time, um, they happened to have a couple of retreats in this place called the Cumberland Lodge in the UK, which is in the Great Windsor Park. And I happened to have um, been invited. As I was a PhD student at the time, this is 2003. And I went to one of their retreats. And I've been working in this field of search-based software engineering ever since. Um, so this has become a very popular area. This is a graph. They have a repository of papers. And on this graph, you can see this is around 2004 or 5 when I was first starting to really publish in this area. Um, unbeknownst to me, I had I was actually publishing papers in this area during my PhD without realizing this was a growing field. And this graph ends in about 2000, 
2011 when they stopped keeping track and you can see that the number of pump patients per year were increasing. Today, most of our software engineering conferences have tracks um, in the conferences on search-based techniques and it's now become very mainstream in our, in our software engineering. So many of these are what we call bio-inspired algorithms. And the reason is because many of the techniques we use in search-based software engineering, these are all heuristic or meta-heuristic algorithms, so they're not exact algorithms. And they have names such as genetic algorithms, which follow evolution in, um, or you know, simulate evolution or swarm intelligence. So one of the common ones is ant colony optimization, where they're fo ants are foraging and we're doing a distributed search to try to find some optimal solution in their case, they're looking for food or artificial life immune systems. So these are some of the common um, algorithms that we use. Um, they all have some common elements. So what I'm going to call the chromosome or the representation, depending on the algorithm, it may not be, may not be called the chromosome. And the idea is that I have um, some representation. In this case, I'm just showing you a feature diagram, which is a software engineering construct. And it's translated into some number of genes. So these are the, um, the, um, the pieces or the elements of the representation. And then each of those genes has some set of alleles or um, the possible values it can take. And I show two examples here. One is some constraints. So I might have an expression tree as my chromosome. So I have to take my problem and represent it as in this representation. And then I have a series of a population of multiple genes and now I have to have ways for those genes to sort of interact with each other and change. So there's a transformation or navigation. So this is a very simple chromosome just with some integers. And I can say that its neighbor is any change, one, a change of one of those genes to a different allele. So I have to have some sort of transformation functions that I can move between solutions. And then the last piece is that this is all being controlled by something called fitness or a quality of solution. So if I'm using one of these algorithms, for instance, to generate test cases or to refactor code, which are very common uses of search-based software engineering, um, I have to be able to say, if I have two solutions in front of me, which one's fitter? So if my test case gets to a branch, which is closer to the branch that I'm trying to generate a test case for, or my refactored solution has fewer bad smells, then it's going to be of higher quality. And so I have to be able to measure that. And then finally, we have these two important pieces. Um, we have some important pieces. So we have operators. And these are, again, nature inspired. So we have selection, crossover, mutation. These are operators that you would hear in nature if you think about what happens during evolution. Now, they're all controlled by two things. So one thing is intensification. So what we try to do is we're trying to search and try to narrow our space and go towards a solution. So all of our solutions start to look more and more alike as we intensify. And then we want to be able to diversify by adding some diversity back in the solution through mutations and other ways um, that we have in our, in our algorithms to keep some novelty in the solution so we don't get stuck in um, these local optimums throughout the space. So this is kind of how they all work. Um, and the result is that we get this beautiful, this is a, um, a, a not a real graph. This is a graph of an ideal fitness. We have a, a set of solutions in this big space, and the goal is to be able to search and find that, in this case, the minimum, that spot at the bottom, which is our optimal solution in this space. So as I said, for years, people are using this in, um, in the world of search. And one of the really um, well-known examples, this is by um, Leguess et al, have worked in something called automated program repair. Um, so this is Genprog, one of their um, original algorithms they created. And the idea is that I have a program here and I have a bug in that program. And what this does is it first it uses fault localization, it finds where that bug is, and then it goes and it finds code in other parts of the program and uses genetic programming to actually um, repair it by replacing lines of code driven by a set of test cases until it no longer fails any test cases. Um, another extension of this, a more generic extension of, of program repair, is something we call genetic improvement. And so um, this is some work by um, Harmon et al. from their Gizmo project, where they looked at non-functional requirements. So can I take a program, and I don't want to now hurt any of its functional requirements, so I want it to perform the same functions, but I want to do it with lower energy, or I want to do it um, more quickly. And so what they've been able to do is, for instance, take 
a program and um, so one of the really nice examples they used sat solvers and they took some sat solvers and they took code from um, examples this is from work that petka um, at all did and they took some code from sat solvers and they tried to optimize it for a particular use case and removed some of the other the code in the program so that it ran much faster on that problem while still solving it correctly so this is genetic improvement and going one step further people have done something called software transplantation so this is from bar um, harman et al where they take some code and they have a donor and a host and the idea is that i want to transplant code so so, so their example here is they have um, vlc which is a video player and they want to put in a new codec and they uh, have shown it took about 20 days for manual to manually take put implant this new codec in code from programmers and within um, a day of running this or i think it may even be closer more like 20 minutes of computational time they can actually transplant that code automatically using these techniques so these have been very successful techniques and notice they're all automated and they're using these search algorithms and this has moved to industry so there's a group um, of researchers at UCL in London, and they had a, um, a tool called, at the time it was called Magic, uh, which was using um, genetic algorithms, multi-objective algorithms actually, to generate test cases for um, mobile devices. Um, they actually now moved to Facebook, and they've developed from that um, something called Sapiens and Sapfix, and these are two uh, so Sapiens is a test generation tool that uses multi-objective optimization, and Sapfix is an automated bug repair tool. And they've written several papers, so you can look for some of these papers from Facebook, and now they're using this in their production system. Now, there's a caveat. The bugs that they fix and the patches that they produce are done automatically, but they still go through manual verification. So the engineers are given the patches that were generated by these automated techniques, and they have to accept them before they go out into production. So this has gone, so from 2003 until now, this has really grown into um, a very a realistic and industry ready technique. Um, but there are characteristics. So first of all, all these algorithms are heuristics and they're not exhaustive, so we can't prove things about them. They're often dependent on the quality of, of test suites, dynamically running these programs. So there's a lot of work that has to be done in that area because um, eventually, over time, their specifications change. They're evolving, and as they evolve, um, their specifications are their test suites. So if we go back, way back to the beginning of software engineering, um, we were arguing for um, very clear specifications and for designing first, and now we're finding our test suites are becoming our specifications. And it's not clear, but they may lose modular complexity may increase. And this is an open question, actually I'm very interested in, but as these systems evolve over time, they sort of change their characteristics. So these are what I call um, organic programs because they have very, they have characteristics of, um, they're coming from these bio-inspired programs and they're sort of in, organic in nature. So I wanna talk a little bit today about, I've given you some context and I've talked about these bio-inspired programs. Um, and I wanna take a step back now and I wanna talk a little bit about some of my work in testing and configurability and what I've been calling traditional software. And then I'm going to come back to what to another class of organic programs, which I call inspired bio, which hopefully you'll see the connection there. And then I'll talk a little bit if I have time about something called organic software product lines and assuring these and tell you a little bit about what I view as my software engineering of the future. So if I think about traditional software, I think about things like Firefox, LibreOffice, um, Eclipse, all the kinds of systems that you're used to working with. Um, this is a, um, a surgery, a robotic surgery system, which I've done a little bit of work on a system like that. I still consider it traditional or just the Linux system. And all of these software systems have something in common. So they're all what we call customizable. So if I want to use um, Linux or I want to use Firefox, I can go in and change how I'm going to use that system and configure it for my purposes. Um, so we call these configurable. So here's an example. Here's Firefox, an old version of Firefox, and I can go to my preferences menu. And when I go in there, I open this up and I can open new windows in a new tab, or I can um, choose whether or not to warn when I close multiple tabs. And there are many menus that I can make, um, that I can change. I'm just looking at the general, at the tabs menu right here. 
And <clears throat> so when I run, when I actually use Firefox, it may run slightly differently than when you use it, depending on how I've chosen to configure it. There's many different interfaces. So I've just shown you this first one, which is the example that I see from the menu. But I may also go in and just modify this in a file. So inside of Firefox, if you go into your directory, there's a file called prefs.js, and then there's user prefs. There's actually nine or 10 different files that Firefox has. The last time I looked, all JS files. And I can just go in and manually set these. So in this case, I have browser tabs, worn on close, set to false. When my system starts up, it will use that. Um, configuration options. Or I can come into something, um, there's an interface which many systems have. I know Chrome has one as well, but this is Firefox. And if I type about colon config in Firefox, anybody can do this. I now get a list of all of the different options, many more than are in the menus. And so you can see here, I can select these and it gives me um, the, the whether it's set, the type and the value, and I can change these. Um, and there's right now, there's over 2,000 of these in about config in Firefox, so I can change those as I like and change how my system works. Of course, you will get this warning before you're allowed to go into about config. Um, so I'm not allowed to really tell you to do it. It's at your own risk. Um, and you'll see why soon, but having all these different configurations, while it's very useful for us, also may cause some problems and issues. Uh, so just one extension of this I wanted to mention is this idea of software product lines and software product lines are really just these configurable systems, but they're managed. So we have these nice models so we can say that in these are really used more originally in industry, although we're now using these um, people are calling Linux, for instance, a product line. So the idea is that I can actually model the commonality and the variability. So I have a set of cars here and they all have horsepower, but some are manual have manual um, transmission, some have auto, some have air conditioning, some have cruise control. And so I can actually create what I call a feature model and dem and look at the entire set of products. Um, I can actually represent these all as a set of constraints and reason about what valid products are in my system. And it gives me a way to work um, very nicely with the whole set of products in my system. Okay, so the problem is that software fails. We know that. So we've seen a lot of examples. I won't go into depth into many of these. Some of these are um, cyber physical. So the one on the right is our Toyota acceleration problem, which is a well known bug. We have the heart bleed, um, which is a security blog. And every year, Tricentis reports this is numbers from 2017 that $1.7 trillion was lost in revenue because of software failures. Um, and it's increasing every year. So we still have. Um, problems and failures. And so we need ways to sort of test systems and this configurability causes problems. We also have security bugs and many of these, if you read them, it says the solution is to remove or limit some one of those configuration options. So they want you to change your configurations. And this is very common to lock things down so you can't add these different configurations. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So here's a very simple example. This is a media player, it's, um, what I'm gonna call a product line. And I have um, different kinds of encoding. So I might have an MPEG, RAW, or WAV encoding. I have different formats, audio, video, or stream, and different caching levels, low, medium, high. And I also have closed captioning or network access, which I can turn on or off. And in order to actually test this system, I need to have one specific configuration selected. Because to test something, you have to dynamically run it. So I have to have a, an actual, um, either a simulator or a physical device to do this. And what is a test case? So I might have a test case that says open video and play to completion. And I may have hundreds of these test cases. So we're just gonna look at one. So I might run a test case and I'm using raw encoding, um, video format, caching level high, and I don't have any other options turned on. And it passes. But suppose now I just change my caching level from low to high. It's very possible that now my system crashes and I have a bug. And, and the reason is because when we build software and we build these configurations, we tend to do this in a modular way. And so when I built, for instance, my encoding and I built the raw encoding, I might have envisioned a system that had a high caching level. I might not have considered it being used with this low caching level. And so I might not have initialized it to a large enough memory space, or I might have not considered some other aspects of it. And so when I put them together, I crash. And these are considered um, interaction faults because they happen to combinations of these configurations. And this is one of the very common areas where systems 
um, fail. And so understanding configurability in these large systems is very important. So in practice, I'll show you what happens. This is one of my first grad students. I still use this graph because I love it. Um, so configurations are on the y-axis. Um, these are 60 different configurations. If you're looking at a graph, I'll tell you in a second, this is the VI editor VIM. And so we manipulated it into 60 different possible configurations because there's a, there's a file you can read in that will change its, its um, different preferences. And then we have 14 different seeded faults in this system. And what these bubbles are telling me, or these are telling me how many tests in my test suite, I had about 900 test cases here, how many tests were able to detect that fault? So this is an experimental environment. And so you can see, for instance, where I have this circled, there are many, of, lots of the test cases find faults, um, but you also see these big holes. And what's that showing me? Is that showing me that had I tested um, in this range of configurations between C20 and C30, um, I would never have found fault nine and 10. They would have been hidden because I didn't actually execute that code um, in a way that would detect them. So this is one of the challenges of configurability is that we have these spaces um, where we can find, find or not find. And we see like, for instance, fault 12 is a very, um, very sort of similar result. So there's not a lot of variability, but many of these other parts of the system have lots of variability in the sizes of those bubbles. Um, now, once we find those faults, we know that it crashes, we have to have some ways to be able to understand what's causing them. And so, again, we go back to some of these other kinds of AI techniques, not learning. Um, so we use something a lot, very often called classification tree. This is a very simple example. Um, I may have a bunch of different configuration options. In this case, I'm focusing on the cookies. And this, again, is a heuristic algorithm that will try to determine um, what might cause a failure. So I'll give it passing and failing um, test cases. And in this case, it might tell me that under cookies, I have three options, allow, restrict, or block. And when I allow or I restrict, um, I'm never crashing. But whenever I block, I have two options, crash or no crash. And so um, this will um, recursively come up with heuristics to try to explain to me uh, what some possible reasons are for these, uh, for these, uh, the, the combinations that cause these failures. And this is a heuristic, but we use these trees a lot. Okay, so let me go back to this. We have configuration spaces, but let's talk about what real configuration spaces are. So I'm going back to my simple example. Well, I have three times three times three times two times two. So I have 108 configurations in this system. If I think about the fact there's no constraints and I can combine all of the encodings with all of the captionings, et cetera. Um, but what if I extend this and I now have 10 different things I'm changing? Remember, Firefox has over 2,000. Um, and now each one has five options. I'm looking at over 9 million configurations, almost 10 million. And if it takes me about four hours to run a test suite, which is not uncommon in a large system, so I think GCC can take up to eight hours, sometimes their full test suite. Um, I'm looking at 4,500 years if I want to exhaustively test that configuration space. And the GCC optimizer, which, um, so most of you are probably familiar with GCC. Uh, if you're not, it's the GNU compiler. Um, it has many options, but in just the optimizer itself, which is its probably most complex part of the system, it has 199 options. And we've modeled those. Um, they're not all binary, so we've done some modeling of those. And it has a space of 10 to the 61. So even if it took a second to run all the test cases for GCC, and we did this in parallel, clearly we can't exhaustively test these spaces. So what we've done over time is we've looked at different ways to sample spaces. And one of the areas that I've worked in a lot is something called combinatorial interaction testing. So if we go back to the original example, if you remember, we said that um, we had the fault because we changed the caching level and it was interacting with potentially um, that um, the, um, the format It had to do with when it was in a raw format. And in general, what we found in software is that we tend to have these lower order interactions. So if we look at all pairs of combinations or all three-way combinations, we tend to find more of the um, faulty systems. So here's an example. Um, so what CIT does or common trail interaction testing is it samples the space. So in this case, for instance, if I look at MPEG, you'll see I combine it with stream video and audio, which are all the options there. And if I look at caching level, I have combined MPEG with all of the different caching levels. And if I look at any two columns in this particular sample, 
um, I will find all of those pairwise combinations. And so this is something we use a lot. Um, we've used these in combinations with classification trees and um, we get good results, not as good as exhaustive, but we get pretty good results and we've been able to detect um, failures uh, and be able to determine what those, what the causes of those are. Uh, we can, so here's just some um, experimental data. So if I have fault detection on my uh, y-axis and these are just box plots. So these are going back to those 60 configurations. This is the VI editor again, Vim. And I look at seven versions. You can see that there's a range. This is the percent of fault detection from the maximum we can detect. And those red dots that you see on my screen, um, those are actually the default configuration. So we took this out of a system called SIR, which is the Software um, Infrastructure Repository, uh, which has many software systems. And when they provided this for us, they gave us one default configuration. As you can see, some cases we got about the median fault detection. Other cases, we actually did worse on the default. But we, in many cases, could provide could find more faults by changing those configurations. And this is just using random. So just to show you that when we sample using these systematic techniques, we do slightly better than we do with random selection. Okay, so that's kind of overview a little bit of some of this fault detection and configurability work I've done. And I think it's important to know that this is everywhere. So I just wanna kind of show you an example. This is, the, um, this is a bioinformatics tool called BLAST. You don't have to know much about it, but people um, enter into BLAST um, a genetic sequence. And what they do is they try to find um, a similar sequence. There's databases of known sequences and they try to identify their sequence. And it turns out, so this is a very common tool. This is used, one of the most common used bioinformatics tools. This is actually a screenshot from the NIH page where it's hosted. Um, it turns out that there are all these different algorithm parameters. Um, we've modeled BLAST and there are over 2 million configurations. And we've done some work trying to understand what the impacts are on um, bioinformatics users and some of the challenges for them in this and many other bioinformatics tools. So configurability is everywhere and it seems to impact our tools. And you've seen now that we've got this in combination with these we're calling organic programs. So what I'd like to do is just take a complete step back now and talk about something else that has nothing to do with configurability, or maybe it does, but we're gonna, we're gonna see if it does. And so this is called systems biology. So, this picture in the middle here is something called the anaerobic digestive tank. This used to be, and this is in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I used to live. And this tank, what it does is it takes um, landfill waste. So all of the organic landfill waste that we would um, produce goes into this tank every week. And, and then inside of it, there are bacteria and it produces green energy or produces methane. And then that methane was used by our electric plant to then do some of the power powering of our electric plant. And so systems biology tries to understand the balances and the inputs. So they might be asking, well, what happens if um, the type of food that we're eating in our landfill starts to change? What if our inputs start to change over time? Or what if I want to increase that methane output? Should I be using, should I be focusing on only parts of the landfill waste? How can I increase production? And so they start to ask these very high level systems questions about, um, about biology. Um, but importantly, inside of this tank are all of these bacteria. And so these bacteria are the ones that are doing all the work. They're eating, um, they're taking that waste and they're creating the methane. Okay, so those bacteria actually can be modeled with something we call a metabolic network model. This is a distributed model. So behind me, behind the screen is a picture of a model from actually, I think this is E. coli behind me. Um, and it's essentially a completely distributed computing environment. It's made up of chemical reactions. Um, these occur in solution at times and people have modeled these and they can reason about what happens in those reactions. Um, e. coli has more than a thousand reactions and more than 60,000 pathways. So these are very complex organisms. And E. coli is something I mentioned because you've probably heard of E. coli. Um, you quite often hear about these when you hear about food scares, but actually there are many um, the E. coli lives in our, um, in our gut and uh, is not harmful in, in many of its forms. Okay, so I'm gonna step back again. I'm gonna go back and forth for a minute so you kind of get to understand this. Um, but I wanna talk here about configurable software again. So let's go back to what happens in Firefox. So suppose in Firefox, I have this configuration which is gonna turn HTS priming um, on. And 
I have another one that's going to block it and a third one that's going to block it with alternative content. So what's happening at the code level? Well, in the code, um, if there's some code that's just going to occur, but you can see that we're actually have a bunch of if statements talking about some of these configurations. So if I have configuration A turned on, um, then this code is going to execute. And if I have configuration B turned on, then this other code is going to execute. And if I have configuration C turned on, some different code is going to execute. And this is why we have these problems with fault detection, because we're executing different code. Uh, so there's common coverage, and then there's also variable coverage. So we kind of see this mixture of coverage, and this is how configurable software works. And if we have a bug, we may find it or not, depending on where we're actually looking. So I'll come back to the metabolic network. So this is some real data. So this is a set of reactions from within some organisms we looked at. And I have this configuration called A. It turns out it's, a, it's an input, so it's like glucose or it's one of our compounds. And on the, this, these are reactions. So on the left, I have some compounds and R1, R2, R3 are just reactions. Now, if I put this into configuration B, you can see that that R2 no longer is active. So that reaction has stopped. And now if I put this into configuration where I have both A and B present in my system, reaction two is still stopped. So it's not, it's actually interesting because it's not additive, it's, it has a different behavior. And R3 is behaving differently, it's actually reversed. So we're seeing this very interesting behavior, which is very software-like. We're not just seeing this additive um, additional behavior, but we're seeing very discrete behavior depending on what these compounds are that we've put in this system. So what our configurations are. So this is some work I do with some biochemists and we built something called Biosymp. So we kind of use this idea of modeling like this um, configuration modeling. Um, we include sampling, which might be CIT or it could be exhaustive or some sort of random sampling. We then run experiments or simulations. We take our data. We then try to do inference using classification. So just like we did in configurable systems. And then we go back and we model them looking at their reaction coverage and then try to predict what's going to happen. So we did some real organisms. We looked at two gut bacteria, um, B theta and M smithii. This was with um, Nicole Bond, who's my biochemistry um, collaborator. And we saw that waste um, and this is important, these two organisms work together in the gut. And basically they're linked to some disorders such as obesity and they work synergistically. So they're kind of important bacteria. So these are some trees that we got from this experiment. The one on the left, this is lab data. So we actually use this biosymp to drive some lab experiments to sample. And in this case, you can see on our tree, we have glucose when it's off, nothing grows. When it's on, it grows. And then there are some interesting relationships where we have this connection between vitamin K and B12, which still allows it to grow a little. And so this was very interesting for our biologists. Um, and they're looking at some of these relationships when we did this. Uh, we also see that um, this, the right side is our simulation. So we use simulation software. And again, we have glucose at the top, which is on or off. But now we see some different, um, different chemicals. Acetate seems to be our next part of the decision tree. And so we don't really have an answer here. This may be because the um, model wasn't good, and didn't actually um, represent nature, but actually um, our collaborators are looking at this acetate problem now because they think that there's some real pathways here. And so they're very interested in this. So um, we got two different trees based on how we actually ran these experiments. But we got some of these experiments and we did some sampling and we found some similar results by using these um, CIT sampling. So let me come back to the model that we created. So this is a model. And on the y-axis, again, we have configurations. Configurations are these compounds we have in our, in our experiments. And on the x-axis are a small set of the reactions that we saw. So there's 900 reactions. We're just looking at about 35 of them. And if we look at this, we see positive flux, negative flux. These represent different directions of the reactions. And then we see no flux. And what's interesting here, we had 128 um, different configurations, but it condensed to 14 patterns. So it condensed to a very reasonable set of patterns. And we think it looks very similar to this map we are seeing in VIM. So what I'm showing you here is that we're seeing that this biology is behaving very similar to what we're seeing in these configurable systems. We also saw common code, variable code, everything we see that we see. So these are the reactions in our two subjects that we see in software. So our question is, is this like Firefox? Is it behaving just like a configurable system? 
Um, and we're calling this perhaps configurable organic software, where these are now inspired bio rather than bio inspired. Uh, we've actually implemented this in a knowledge base run by the Department of Energy called KBase, Predictive Biology System. And we've given them also a decision tree app. And we're, um, so this is being used now by some of the bio biologists who are, <coughs> who are working in this area. Okay, so I'm gonna go one step further. I've got a little more time to talk about. Um, so I've talked about the systems biology. Now I wanna talk about synthetic biology. So we started with the biofuels. Um, well, people are also using biology in very interesting ways today. So this idea of environmental remediation, tissue engineering, or intelligent drug delivery. What, what um, is happening today is people are engineering organisms or bacteria to have new functionality to be able to satisfy this. So the long-term goal, for instance, for intelligent drug delivery, is suppose I have some cancer cells, they want my drugs to be able to, um, so the idea is you'd have a little nano um, device and you would, your drugs can now detect certain um, aspects of your system and target those cancer cells. And that's kind of this long-term goal of that. Um, so this idea of synthetically or engineered organisms is that we design functions, we build these into DNA, and then we engineer them, we in put these into the plasma of the organisms the organisms then reproduce and re and generate new organisms with that new functionality. And we now have a population of genetically engineered um, bacteria. And so we have this high level code, which this is SB, um, SBOL, which is a soft, which is a um, programming environment. Uh, we compile it to plasmids, then our organism takes it on and it's like machine code and it reproduces and we have a series of bacteria with this new functionality. Um, and we do this at a systems level. So are these biology, are these organisms software systems? Well, we're looking at them in that way and many people are today. So in just case you're convinced, this came out of a competition. Somebody built one of the first synthetic biology systems. They built Hello World just to show them that they're real software. Um, so every year there's a competition called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which is both students, university, high school students. Um, so I've met both and every year they get a package like this. So it's a, it's a usually multidisciplinary team. Um, those are all vials of DNA. So this was one of our, I worked on a couple of teams is one of our that gets sent to us in the mail and these go in the fridge. They get a bunch of stickers as well. Um, and they now create a project. And every year about 4,000 people, um, probably not this year, but up until this year would show up in Boston for a competition in November. And so I, when I was in Nebraska, I hosted um, I worked on a team, two separate iGEM teams, and we had students build projects. And they build projects that are usually interesting to them. They learn about um, engineering, and they usually have some computer science students, some biology students, chemistry students. This is one of our teams. You can see they let me um, put on a lab coat once in a while, but they don't let me actually use the pipettes. Just I just get to stand in the lab. Um, so. We've looked at these and we've seen that we have these organisms. Um, we have GenProg, we have MuScalpel. So I would argue these are all the same in the end. These are all what I would call organic programs because they have very similar kinds of characteristics. Now, the downside of this, I have a student, a student of mine, Justin, who recently graduated, um, was very interested in the safety. And here's some quotes that um, he pulled out from various um, papers that it would be difficult for our teams to gain real world biosafety approval and um, the iGEM itself says they can't certify their project as safe. So part of the um, competition is they have to, they have very, they have safety pages. They have to also document that everything is destroyed at the end. So these are, there's very rigid um, requirements in these competitions, but these are being used, it's also being used in the real world. Um, so we wanted to look at how we could assure the safety. These are safety critical programs now. And so how do we know they work? So we started looking at assurance cases, which are logical arguments that basically um, say, for instance, here's a very simple example of a, of a goal. Our goal is the logical circuit will never produce a false at this junction. And then we have other arguments and eventually we have some evidence that supports that goal. And these are used for avionics, nuclear plant safety, et cetera. And so we looked at a, one of the iGEM teams from, um, this was a 2012 team. And what we did is we modeled their program. So I'm just going to go through very quickly. They basically were trying to use bacteria. They had a little pouch and they were trying to determine when meat went bad in your fridge. So the idea is you had this, your meat in the fridge and the bacteria, there were two parts to it. One could detect nitrogen and then the other would turn a different color when the nitrogen was detected and they worked together in a packet to be able to alarm you when your meat is going bad. So they had these two different parts they built. 
And so we built an assurance case for this project using all of their safety pages and tried to build this out. And so you can see here just the high level goals that it's safe. Um, we have our organism. Um, we talk about our arguments. So things like the sticker will keep it sealed in isolation and we have our evidence. Um, but what we learned in this is that the software changes. So we have things like mutation and conjugation and the bacteria can suddenly start to consume ammonia. And so we might have structural changes in our safety cases. The bacteria can digest alternative sugar because it's evolving, we're, we're you know, mutating over time. And so we might have changes in our evidence. And so we built something called the assurance timeline, which looks at evolution in insurance cases and tries to build something we call an evolution envelope with my bacteria. So if I E. coli, I can, I can actually measure how often it reproduces, how likely, so most mutations make very small changes and they won't change it behaviorally. How long does it take before a big behavioral change is likely to happen? And we can reason about that and then build these timelines and know when we have to reassure our systems. So if I think about that and I go back to the Gizmo project, I think about genetic improvement as I'm evolving software now and I'm doing this in an automated fashion without um, this, you know, humans in this modularity, are we going to see similar things? And maybe we need to be thinking about these kinds of dynamic things with all of our organic programs. So I'm going to leave you kind of with that thought. Um, the last little piece I want to talk about is this thing called, so I go back to this iGEM competition. They have a repository. So every year, students have to submit their parts back to the repository. It's, they tout this as one of the largest open source repositories of DNA parts. Anybody can go and you can read about their parts. You can get all of the DNA. And in the past, you could actually, and you can actually order, if you're part of a team, you can order DNA actually from their system. And right now, they have about 40,000 parts, I think, uh, about 45,000. And if I come to the repository, I've just sorted this by the 10 most used parts. So these are different. Um, the name on the left is just the name of the part. And I can look and see what it's doing. And if you see that it says uses and status, so this one's used 3,700 times, this one's used 3,200 times, 900 times. So that means people have actually requested these parts and used them in their projects. So they're meant to be um, reusable um, parts that are, you know, like they call them bricks that people can then put into their own projects. And when I worked on teams, several of our teams ordered parts from other projects. So if I look at this, you're probably thinking, because you're mostly software engineers, how is this any different from GitHub? Well, it's kind of maybe not because it has the same type of environment. So we try to look at this and I only talk very briefly, but this is some of the various parts. Um, and we're looking at some of the types of parts. So we have coding, regulatory, and we looked at how many parts fell into these categories. And so we've actually done a study on the BioBricks repository. Um, and we've also built some what we call organic software product lines. So this is an example of a project that's looking at something called cell to cell signaling, which is one of the most common functions people build. This is communication that's happening between cells. And so we've built a product line for this, which demonstrates how the different parts in that repository fit together to actually aid. Um, so we've actually shown this to some synthetic biologists to try to see if this would help them to reason about their systems and understand how they put these parts together. So this is some of the work we're doing. Um, and eventually we want to be able to annotate these biobrick repository with the feature models and assurance cases and think about maybe doing safety driven development. And so I have some undergraduate teams right now that have built a connection between the repository and one of the feature modeling tools we use in software engineering, trying to um, try to build that workflow so that we can eventually extract those parts and present that to the biologists. Okay, I'm talking the last tiny thing. I just want to mention some work I'm doing. I won't really talk about it, but I'm also working in something called molecular programming, where we, um, it's a programming um, paradigm, which basically abstracts chemical reactions to these equations, like A plus um, B goes to C plus D. Um, we then simulate these. And so we can do things like add and subtract. These are used for building nanostructures for all sorts of, um, so this is a distributed programming environment. And we've just, on um, an ASE this year, we had a, um, paper on ChemTest, which is a testing framework to test the simulations in MATLAB to try to look at how we test these distributed systems. So I'm kind of out of time, but I want to tell you a little bit about, um, we talked a little bit about these bio-inspired optimization algorithms about organic programs. Hopefully it convinced you that biology is programming and software. 
talked a little bit about modeling and how we can look at systems biology and look at that as these configurable systems. And finally, we talked about organic software product lines, and I'm still working in all of these areas. Um, so I think my, my future of software engineering is automated, configuration aware, um, testing, assurance, and repair of organic programs. Um, and so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I guess I'll kick things off. So, so Myra, I mean, gosh, this is, uh, it's fascinating and honestly a little scary. And, and I get that reaction a lot. I presented <laughs> some of this at, a, I think the first time we presented the assurance cases was at um, SafeConf, which is a safety and reliability conference with people there that work on nuclear systems. And um, I couldn't get through my talk. They couldn't believe some of this was happening. So. <laughs> But, it, but it's happening, so we have to, we want to keep up with them, right? So we want to build these systems so we build them safely, right? And I think we have an opportunity. Like, how did, how, how did you find yourself, so like going from, you know, um, combinatorial configuration spaces that are, you know, it, you know search-based stuff that definitely has an organic flavor to it, to then actually organic? So, so one of my collaborators, so I, um, so one of my collaborators, um, so I should actually show, so these are some of my collaborators here. These are students, but, um, but I also have some collaborators. Um, so one of my collaborators in Nebraska, um, so Max Paraban works in communications and he works in nano communications. And so when he first came there, I started, learned about this idea of synthetic biology and he, we started working with Nicole Bond and she is a um, biochemist and Nebraska. And so we started working together and one of my PhD students got, I put, I put, she was a new student, it's Michaela, she went on the project um, and she got really, really fascinated with this and she worked a lot with the graduate student in biochemistry. So they work together a lot because there's a lot of gap you have to bridge and that's where we first worked on Biosymp and first tried to look at these systems and to me it was a natural example of configurability when they were talking about all these different combinations. And the first question she just wanted to ask was they had, you know, been using all this different, what they call media, which is the different growth compounds. And, um, and Nicole works in these methanogens. So these are these gut bacteria. So they have this big system where they have no oxygen and they, you know, have these big chambers. They run these experiments and they were using these um, different um, media and they didn't really know why. So they didn't know why they had some, so some of the compounds, it's kind of like a lure. So they, you know, some of the base compounds, everybody has in the media, but then what are the important growth compounds? And so they wanted to ask that simple question. And I thought this seemed like a natural example of using something like a combinatorial testing or modeling it as factors. So, um, so what we did is we, looked at that and I have to credit my student, Michaela, who's actually now a postdoc at Oak Ridge in their bioinformatics division, um, who really brought it along and made that connection. So once I started there, then I worked with Max and another collaborator, Wei Nu, who's at also in Nebraska, where we built these iGEM teams. And for me, that was just fun. I wanted to see how these undergraduates built teams. And I, and I went to all of their training. So I did go to the lab training and I did go to the lectures on how synthetic, so I at a high level know how synthetic biology works, but I, um, I didn't have the time to actually do anything in the lab. As I said, it was safer if I didn't. So, so, uh, so I spent a lot of time with the students and I learned from them. So really all these two teams of undergraduates were amazing. These were all outstanding students. We actually, they won um, medals when they went and it, that really taught me a lot about the synthetic biology. Um, and then obviously from there I've moved on, but yeah. Amazing, that's cool. And it's important to have collaborators, right? So I have collaborators sure. now that work in this uh, molecular programming, which I don't work in, but I'm learning about it. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anybody's free to, you can just unmute yourself or um, type in the chat. So, so Myra, uh, thank you for the really exciting talk. Um, I, I, I like this uh, increasing push in software engineering for computational science that you've been a part of. Um, but I'm curious as more about the pitfalls and challenges you face, like really working in a domain that's similar but still really different from software engineering and how you've overcome it. 
Yeah, so there's there's a lot of challenges with communication with, um, as I said, so I had, it was really good. So my student, Michaela, worked a lot with um, uh, with the student in, um, in biochemistry, and that was very important. So Jenny, so the two of them worked together. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ramp up time. So it took us a long time before we got our first, our first work together. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I've only gotten my first, I have a biopub now on this work, follow on work from Biosimp and it, it took, you know, many years to get there. So that take, that's a challenge. We speak different languages. We have different ideas of how to write papers, how to do experiments. Um, and also I think that the real challenge I've had is that I think that there's, we can learn from the biology and, and what we're doing in these environments. It's not just straight, we're not just taking the techniques and applying them directly. So for instance, that assurance timeline, we saw that we needed to have some really consider evolution in the assurance case. Um, but the risk is always that if you just do this as a software engineering problem, then it's just an application of, of and so what's the new software engineering? And so we saw that a lot. So we did have, you know, we tried to submit some of this work. We did get to say, well, what's the new software engineering? And so the challenge is always to find the new interesting software engineering that you need to adapt to these new environments and then take what you've learned. So, so for instance, there's some, I know I've talked to people about some really interesting data flow questions. If I look back at those reactions in the, um, in the biology, the reactions go in different directions. Well, data flow goes in different directions. So now maybe we need to improve some of our techniques there to be able to reason about some of these reactions. And so those are the kinds of things that I think are challenging. Um, the work we're doing right now in, in uh, testing chemical reaction networks is a lot of flakiness and there's a lot of really interesting work because there's built in flakiness because these are simulations. And so um, how do we handle that? And how is it different than what people are already doing? So we have to embrace the flakiness, which is for those of you who are familiar with that, it's when tests give you different answers when you run them different numbers of times. And so we don't want, we can't find flakiness and remove it. We have to accept it. And so how do we handle that? And so, and so I think that's some of the challenges, but, but it's a lot of fun as well. Cool. Thanks, Maya. So if anybody, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. I know that this is the end, but um, if you don't want to answer online, I'm, not, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see anything, but I'm also happy to answer post questions from people. Um, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, so I'll put my video on. Um, <clears throat> with the, the whole metabolic network thing that you were showing, that you were modeling, um, mm -hmm. how exactly did you model each part of that, each uh, enzyme within that? Okay, so, yeah, I'll wait, continue. Well, because each protein has a bunch of possible post-translational modification sites on it, right? So you can have a bunch of different states of activity for even any one protein. And so I've always seen it as like a combinatorial nightmare, um, just a single protein, you know? So I'm sort of curious how exactly you handled the case of a huge network of them. Right. So, so for me, the good news, um, this probably isn't going to satisfy your answer. Um, but the good news is I don't have to do the modeling. So, so we're using for all of our modeling, we're using that um, the um, predictive, um, the um, K base, this predictive system. And under the under the hood, they're using these notes. So there's something called KEG. So if you're interested in this, it's called KEGG. Um, this is hosted in Japan, and this is a model of so all the known pathways. So people are manually annotating these pathways. So for years, so that's why something like E. coli is the most well known. So for years, people through science through experiments, and so they would run laboratory experiments. They were building up these models and annotating them with what they know from experimentation, and um, that information is now. Um, built and it, it's sort of built on top of they built something called model seed which builds on top of that and those are the models we're using so we're using models that people have contributed to this k base environment so they're databases of known annotated models and the reason for instance that we maybe sometimes get different answers with simulation than in reality is some of the less known, or, known organization organ organisms such as like our meta um, our methanogens um, there's this step that they call gap filling. So you take this model, you build the model, and then it may not grow because it doesn't know about all of the reactions. And so then they sort of infer from other organisms and they might infer from E. coli. So 
in that case, they sort of build the model out so it can grow. So this is a this is the best known science they have, but it's not necessarily. So I probably didn't really answer your question because I'm not building that model, but we're using this database of models, and probably we could use the other techniques in other simulation environments that have different models. But this is the most common one I think people are using. This um, it comes out of what they call the whole cell model. There was a, a seminal paper from that community on it a while back and they've built up around this. So it's kind of one type of a model. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know if yeah, that answers the question. I thought it was really interesting how you found like a new pathway. I, I come from a biology background. So every time I see like, you know, it, it's almost lore like, like how you describe the methodologies, like we find a pathway and then it's like, ah, oh, that is the pathway, you know, but there's probably so many other ones. And it's interesting then because it's like, on one hand, it seems very plausible that there are other pathways we haven't found, but on the other hand, unless if we really understand that the methodology is accurate, it's hard to know what to take. Right. So some of the work, some of the work I'm doing now, so this is really good. So, so these, so this method of gap filling has always been a little bit of a mystery to me. So many of the algorithms are just like things like linear. Um, so the, the growth that we get out of that is just what we call flux balance analysis. And it's just linear um, optimization under the covers. And that's what's trying to make all these reactions grow. And then they give you the growth at the end. Um, but there's this process called gap filling, which is inferring, and it mostly infers from things like an E. coli, which is really well known. Um, but what I've been doing with current work I'm doing is we're trying to actually bridge some of those gaps. And then, so the idea is that we can run many simulations. I can go on this, and feel free to ping me if you want the data information, but if you search for KBase, you'll find it. Anybody can get a login to it. Um, so there is an SDK, so you can do lots of large experiments. Um, the environment they give you is a GUI. But you can go in and if you run something and you run large scale experiments and then you find interesting areas um, that potentially pathways you didn't know about, then you can run those in the lab. So you still have to go back and validate them and run them in the lab, but the simulation mm -hmm. kind of gives you, points you to some places. And so we're looking at ways to kind of connect those two. That's some of the longer term work we're doing right now. Yeah, very cool, thank you. Alberto, somebody said that you had your hand up, did you? Yeah, so in the beginning I did. Um, something that I, um, I'm, still, I'm still thinking, that's why uh, I didn't end up uh, asking the question, but there, in a certain moment at the presentation, Maya, you commented about um, uh, the complexity that the, the software complexity evolves along the time, right? Um, and in nature, this um, is not necessarily true, right? Because for the same functionality, the complexity of the uh, of a uh, of a certain uh, a functionality in nature is going to decrease because nature will try to reach a state of um, smaller energy, right? So there is a sparsity um, constraint in nature that we don't add to software, right? In software, people will try will move to higher and higher level languages, and this will help to build more complex software that are probably redundant at some point, right? And in nature, we have, so nature usually avoid redundancy in, in, in another way, right? So, so this is an amazing question. So this is an amazing question. So I've thought about this a lot. So this is my conjecture about the complexity. Um, so first of all, there's some really interesting work going on. Um, so Stephanie first is at this, um, at Arizona State, there's this biodesign institute. And so she's looking a lot, they look a lot at robustness. And so they are finding a lot of redundancy in the fact. So this is why this idea of like, I can mutate something and still have the same functionality. And we see that in software as well. You can have many, what you call equivalent mutants if you have mutation testing and we have this redundancy. So functions still work, right? You don't break the software just by one mutant necessarily. But <clears throat> this issue of complexity is, it's a conjecture I have. I don't know if it's true. I've wanted to work on this. I'm happy to chat with anybody about it because I've never been able to actually work on it. Um, but from a software perspective, what I'm talking about complexity is I'm thinking about, we have modularity and we have, you know, we think about, um, you, know, um, you know, keeping our separation of concerns and we think about, you know, only showing as much information or interfaces. And so I worry that, you know, we've thought about all these design constructs and when we start doing this in an automated way, it seems to me that that's gonna be degraded and we may have more, so complexity in the sense of um, more loop, you know, more complex loops or conditions. And I don't really know. Um, so I've talked to a couple of people how we can measure this. So I want, I've always wondered if we take some software and we patch it over time, would we end up with something that's more complex 
my conjecture is it is, but, but you're pointing out some really good things from biology and maybe it isn't. And maybe it depends on where our donor code is. So what kind of code we're using to help us do that automated. So I don't have an answer. It's, it's completely open and you may, you may be correct. So, um, but I'd love to be able to study that at some point. So I just haven't had enough, enough different arms to do it. But it, it's, yeah. a great, it's a great comment because I've spent a lot of time thinking and I'm still thinking about it now. So, yeah. Interesting. Great question. Um, I suppose we'll take one more before we, we cut this off. Uh, so, um, so Meyer, I have one more question. Uh, so as you probably well aware of, um, when, when the pandemic started, there was a lot of people looking into doing some kind of study combining software and COVID-19, some maybe related to COVID-19 data. And I know there's COVID-19 related software out there. And since you're doing biological systems and software engineering for it, I'm curious about your thoughts about essentially software engineering for COVID-19. Uh, another great question. I, I haven't done anything in that domain. I do know that there are some very large bioinformatics groups that are doing distributed computing. So I actually know that there's some work at Oak Ridge right now where they're finding some, they're actually using um, these supercomputers to try to understand some of the, and infer some of the new pathways and they found some new information about the actual COVID itself. Um, I don't feel qualified on the biology end to be doing some of that because they're really, they're working in real bioinformatics. But I think that some of the tools and the systems we're building could potentially be very interesting. And, um, you know, some of our results, so when I look at things that come out of something like BLAST and we have all this configurability, so we had a, you know, this ASE paper two years ago on this. Um, it's really interesting to see how results change based on which parameters you're changing. And so one of the things we did in that work is we tried to, like only look at what we called um, non-functional properties. So we tried not to change configurations that we thought we worked with a BLAST expert. And we said, okay, tell us which configuration options aren't gonna change the, out, well, the functional output because, and we did this for some of these other, not just BLAST, we did it for some of the, um, we did it for the flux balance analysis and a couple other systems. And to be honest, it was very hard to do that. It turns out that, you know, you're dealing with scientific software. So they're using algorithms underneath that are changing the science and how they're doing the filtering. And there's been some interesting discussions. There have been some papers actually pulled recently where um, there was, was a couple of um, blast parameters that people weren't aware. They thought they did something different. So a common thing is that these things aren't well documented and you think that a parameter is changing in a particular way and maybe it's just a filter. Um, and one of the filters that um, people looked at, it was actually a filter, but it's happening in the dynamic programming part. So it's restricting the, the decisions early on rather than filtering at the end. And because of that, when people use that filter, um, they thought that they were doing one thing and they ended up doing something else. So I think that, um, now I'm not arguing that the science is necessarily bad, but I think it impacts the science. And so I think um, you really need to think about how you're using the systems and understand more about how changing those configurations impacts impacts the the results but but having said that i don't i don't have a good i'd happy to chat with you more about it i'm not um an expert in some of the work that's been going on in COVID now of course i think we'd all love to contribute so i'd be happy to chat if you know of some systems that are specifically uh working on that i don't know if i answered that question but yeah. no that was good thank you well, um, with that, I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Myra Cohen. Well, thank you for having me. I would, as I, I'll come in person sometime. Rather yeah, than we would here. love to. I, we would love to have you, okay. and uh, show you around campus when, mm -hmm. when we can actually go to campus and when everything gets back to normal. Yeah, and feel free to send me emails. I'm happy to follow up. And